So first of all, thank you very much, Kaisa, Maya, for the invitation and for organizing. It's always such a pleasure to come to Helsinki from Oxford because compared to the quaint atmosphere of Oxford, this seems always like such a bustling modern metropolis in so many ways. Um, when Kalevi Sorsa was the Prime Minister of Finland in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, Finland transformed from a uh, predominantly agrarian society into a uh, industrial and service economy. And today we are set to be in the midst of another transformation, one towards a digital economy. And so what I've been asked and invited to talk about today is one aspect of that uh, transformation, which is the transformation towards platform-mediated work or labor. And uh, one of the ways in which we can start to structure this phenomena is by looking at these two dimensions. First, uh, the routine versus uh, non-routine dimension. So you have sort of other terms you could use kind of less skilled and, and more highly skilled or, or, or um, non-differentiated and specialized labor. So you have platforms that mediate more routine types of labor and platforms that mediate uh, less uh, routine, more specialized types of labor. Then you also have platforms that mediate labor locally uh, in the local physical environment. And if, so if we look at some of the routine local platforms, that would be the examples that many of us are familiar with, such as uh, Uber uh, or the various food delivery platforms. These are consumer-facing brands, so we are quite well aware of them. But at the same time, there's, there's uh, B2B platforms that, for example, a restaurant owner might use if they need a temp that night for that one night because there's a special event or something like that. And these platforms are very big as well, but we don't really hear about them because they are not consumer brands. Um, then if you look at the, the remote side, so platforms that mediate service work and, and informational labor that can be uh, delivered over distance, over the internet. Uh, that's, that's what I, I specialize in. So we, uh, uh, many people might have hear, heard of microwork, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, this type of click work, transcribing receipts, uh, categorizing images, moderating social media posts, and so on. But then there's another category, which might be called online freelancing, which consists of more specialized, uh, more, more skilled labor, such as graphic design, uh, software development, virtual assistant services, and so on. And these, both the, 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 the routine remote online work as well as the non-routine remote platform-based work, um, together can be referred to as the online gig economy, to distinguish it from the local or offline gig economy. And what I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, mostly is our research on this online gig economy. So I want to talk a little bit about the phenomena, explain some of its dimensions, some of its implications for workers that we've seen so far, and uh, then finally a few ideas on the future of this phenomenon. So I want to give a very concrete example of what some of the work in, in this this box here might be lo might look like. So say if I was a speaker at an event like this, um, but I wasn't very good at actually making nice looking slides, but I wanted to make nice slides to show appreciation for my audience, I might post a job like this, where I say, I've prepared a PowerPoint deck and I would like you to make it look nice. Then a number, so I, I, I describe the, the task, I explain sort of I'm looking for a mix of experience and value. It's a small, it's a short project. It's just a few hours that I'm expecting. Then I get bids. I post this task on a platform and I get bids. I get proposals from workers, uh, from freelance graphic designers all over the world in this case. 
There is Athar from Pakistan who is offering to do this job for $13 an hour. There is Al Mamoum from Bangladesh who is offering to do it for just $5 an hour. But he doesn't have any work experience on the platform so far. And then there's Alvin from the US who would charge $50 an hour for the same work. And in this case, I, I spoke with the uh, candidates and I went with Athar here. The contract was started and the platform provided me with a means of monitoring Athar's uh, labor. So I got periodic screenshots of his screen. So I was able to confirm that the time that he was uh, charging me for was actually spent on this labor, even though he's in the other side of the world in, in, in um, Pakistan. Um, and I also get uh, this measure here, which shows the intensity of his uh, keyboard presses and mouse movements. So very close quantification uh, and measuring of uh, worker performance. And in the end, the end result, this is what I gave to him. Quite basic, right? And this is what he delivered. Nice. Um, and he really liked these stock images, so I got a lot of uh, sort of people looking at uh, walls and computers and pointing at screens uh, on my slides. But I, I had actually deleted those because we don't really, we, we didn't have, our aesthetics weren't exactly the same in that way. But you'll agree that this is a much nicer slide than what I would have been able to produce myself. Now, it's not just people from Pakistan that are doing it. Here is an industrial designer from Finland. Um, whom, with his permission, I'm sharing a picture of his profile on uh, one of the, the leading platforms. Uh, he charges $50 an hour. He's made $50,000 so far through the platform, and he's very highly rated, so he has a very good feedback from uh, his clients. Now, uh, one of the things that we've done in the iLabor project is we've wanted to measure this online gig economy somehow, and We've taken a complementary approach to the survey studies that Professor Hughes and, uh, and more lately some of the stati national statistical agencies have done. And what we've done is we've started tracking all the tasks and projects posted to all the biggest platforms in real time. So every day we download all the tasks, um, all the project postings. We look at when they disappear off the market. Um, and then we do a little bit of data science magic on the background, and we end up with some statistics of this market. And the one basic statistics we can show is that the online gig economy appears to have grown uh, significantly, 38% within the two-year period that we, so far that we've been tracking it. Um, but it's, it's highly, um, there's a, high, a lot of cycl uh, cyclicality here. So New Year and uh, Christmas and New Year, fortunately, the market dips. It seems people are taking some time off. Um, the, the last Christmas, again, a big dip. Huge growth here. We're not sure why. It might be companies at the end of their financial year quickly spending budgets. Um, but the main, main point here is we have a, a very large growth for a labor market. Imagine labor market is usually quite stagnant in today's world. We have 38% growth in two years. And we will keep tracking this so we can say more about it. If we look at where is the demand coming from, and mind you, one methodological uh, caveat I have to mention is that these are all English language platforms that we're tracking here. Um, employee market share by country, US buyers represent about half of the market. Europe, uh, including the UK, is something like 20%, 25%. But Europe is actually growing faster than U.S. Nordic uh, countries, we have some data on Nordic countries as well. Uh, Sweden is the largest buyer of online gig work, followed by Denmark, uh, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. What do employers seek from this platform? So why, who is buying this kind of work? Well, we don't know very much about this yet. We know that there's a lot of different types of people are buying this sort of work. So it ranges from individuals buying a little help for their PowerPoint slides um, to startup entrepreneurs who need some help um, but can't engage a full-time worker to uh, all the way to Fortune 500 firms. So these are some of the biggest companies in the United States. 
as well as some uh, multinational companies such as Samsung that we've studied. And in a nutshell, what we find that these large companies uh, are looking for from platforms. First of all, the surprising thing is that these large companies are using these platforms in the first place. That's quite remarkable, actually, because it means that if, if these platforms get integrated into the HR processes of these massive companies, then it could really create um, a, a lot of growth and, 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 and demand for this type of labor. But what do they seek for there? One of the things is, well, cost advantages. So this is a way of buying work from countries with uh, a lower labor cost, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the, uh, the startup costs, the, um, uh, the overheads compared to their alternative, which for them often is to use a contingent labor agency, the overheads involved are smaller. There's numerical and temporal flexibility, so the ability to rapidly hire for some project-related uh, style work, rapidly hire a number of people, and then something they, the companies don't discuss uh, in interviews, but obviously the flip side of that is also the ability to rapidly let go people when the project is finished. Um, also temporal flexibility, so able, the ability to get, for example, customer support staff to be available in every time zone uh, in the world. And then finally, the, the, in the study, the, the inf interviews talked a lot about skills. So platforms as a way of accessing specialized skills that they don't have in their own team or their own organization. Or just, uh, all, all, not just skills, but also diverse perspectives. A person from a different country, a target market country, for example, who can give insights on that particular country. Then if we look at the worker side, um, our numbers show that uh, the most of the workers by far come from Asia. So traditional uh, outsourcing destinations such as India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Philippines, as well as um, emerging market countries such as uh, Vietnam, for example. And uh, Europe is, uh, but e Europe is also providing a large number of workers to this this economy um, especially Eastern European countries with good technical uh, universities uh, but lower uh, labor cost or less opportunities locally uh, for those people to put their skills to use uh, Africa is appears small but um, actually in relation to the size of those economies some African economies are quite uh, well represented. I'll actually show this on a map. So here's a, this, what this map shows is each country is colored according to the main skill or main type of occupation that workers from that country are performing in the online gig economy. So for instance, if you take this pink, that's software development and technology. And you can see that a lot of Eastern Europe is pink and, and, and Finland included. So they're offering technical uh, work. Um, to the marketplace. South Asia as well, Pakistan, India um, is pink. Um, then if you, I mentioned Africa, so interestingly you have, for example, Kenya is a big supplier of writing and translation style work. South Africa, creative and uh, multimedia. Nigeria, uh, sales and marketing support style work. What do workers seek from these platforms? Many things. So one of the key points I, I wish to make here is based on our studies so far, the, there isn't um, a single stereotypical platform worker. So these are very different kinds of diverse kinds of people who approach this market with very different uh, interests. One of the interests is simply labor market inclusion. So when in a previous project my colleagues and I interviewed people in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa who were earning their income through these platforms, uh, some of them lacked formal work permits in their country of residence through to displacement for what, uh, various reasons. And so they weren't able to access the local labor market in the first place, so they accessed online labor markets instead. There's also people who are discriminated against in the local labor market. They are able to access opportunities in the uh, online labor market. 
And also, if you think about, we haven't studied ride-hailing apps, but we know that uh, ride-hailing apps and self-employment in general is something that first-generation immigrant workers often attach themselves to, not because they necessarily love self-employment, but because, or, or, or Uber driving, but because those are some of the opportunities that are um, actually available to them in a labor market that might otherwise be hard to uh, enter into. Then a completely different set of people uh, are seeking for, uh, for returns to specialized skills. So in some of these countries with quite good education, I mentioned these African countries, for example, the platform workers there, they are, they are relatively privileged people in their countries. They are people with a college education, but few opportunities to put those skills to good use locally. So they will earn a much better income uh, in many cases on uh, their skills uh, through platforms than they would uh, in the local labor market. The same to some extent might apply to some Eastern European countries as well. And even in Finland to some extent as a, as a supplement to uh, regular employment, it might be a, a, an attractive source of additional income for some specialists who are able to charge a very highly rate. The other thing that people are looking for is flexibility. And I have a, I have a quote here from a 30-year-old woman who said, this job is very convenient. I can watch my kids play with them and I don't get tired that much. Before, I had to drive for about an hour to get to the office. Uh, when I got home, uh, I had to sleep. Now, the extent to which flexibility is really achieved on these platforms is a different matter, and I will discuss this next, but it's certainly one of the motivations that people have when they seek um, platform-based uh, work. And then finally, it's, for many people, platforms are a career stage. So it's not necessarily a class of people who, uh, who become you know, platform workers, but it might be, um, might be just a stage in an overall career path. So, for example, people who are seeking to work as freelancers in the technology sector but lack the local contacts to uh, get business, they might start off on a platform to build their contacts and build their portfolio and experience and then move on to, uh, to working as, as an independent worker outside the platform. Uh, it might be a stepping stone to regular employment. So this is quite interesting. This is not something we have much data on, but um, we have spoken, we have encountered people who have, after working for a period of time th through a platform, then become regularized as regular employees by their former clients uh, in the platform uh, and continue to work remotely, but as regular employees. But we don't know how common this is because it's a methodological issue because if you recruit in informants through the platform, by definition, you only find those people who are still on the platform and not those who moved uh, out of it. Uh, this probably only applies to the more skilled end of the platform uh, labor market. So uh, I would expect that, for example, the delivery drivers don't get regularized very much as far as I know. Anyway, I haven't studied them. And then finally, it might be something during career breaks. And during retirement, we've spoken with people who are in their retirement, but they still wish to keep doing something. And this offers them a way to engage with uh, uh, work. Now, so, so overall, I would say that the kind of, if we want to characterize what is different in this type of work compared to the standard employment relationship that has developed through uh, starting from the Industrial Revolution through labor struggle the, and unevenly across different occupations and countries, we've uh, reached this, this uh, or developed this institution called Standard Employment, which consists of employment in the service of a single employer uh, for usually an open-ended uh, period of time uh, with regular full-time working hours at the site of the, the employer's uh, company. Whereas platform mediated work is often, it's, it's all, on all those three dimensions. So single employer, instead of a single employer, you will work for multiple clients. 
instead of working regular full-time hours, you will be working uh, flexibly according to, uh, uh, I will talk next about how the hours are set, but you will, you will not have regular hours, but instead hours that are flexible. And in terms of the location, instead of being working at the uh, employer's uh, site, you will be working remotely, telework or, or telecommuting that Professor Hughes has uh, researched for a few decades now. Um, so this kind of this mode of working, what what are some of the challenges that it presents for workers? So there's a lot I could uh, say about this, but to begin with, obviously it brings the kind of bargaining over pay and working conditions to an individual level. So instead of bargaining as a um, as an occupational group uh, or as a set of employees of a company, you are bargaining as an individual worker uh, with the employers and with the platforms. And this is great for sought after specialists like uh, Jarmo, the industrial designer, who is able to negotiate very good deals because he has skills that many em employers are willing to pay a lot for. But it does place competitive pressures uh, on ordinary workers who don't have uh, a lot of individual bargaining power thanks to specialized skills or contacts or similar. And so here's an here's a image from Jarmo's um, track record on the platform. So these are some of the projects that he has completed in the past and the feedback that the clients have left. And you can see that he has received very good feedback. There's a lot of five stars there. There's a one four star feedback there. And so he's in, in that sense in a very good position. But then what if you don't have those five star reviews? What if you don't have all those special skills? I studied in a different study, I, I, I studied people who do um, the lower end of online gig work, this sort of uh, manual routine click work, categorizing images and so on. And in, in that sort of work, um, essentially the, your, 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 the, the flexibility of the work actually depends on the structural conditions. So if you have a lot of work available on the platform, this would apply also, I believe, in, in something like food deliveries and, 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 and rides, uh, taxi rides as well. If you have a lot of work available on the platform, and you don't really depend on the income too much, it's just a second uh, job or something like that, then it's a very nice situation. You can schedule your work flexibly. You can work when you want to, not work uh, when you don't want to. But um, if, the, if, if work is less available on the platform, then essentially, and, but, but you're, not, you're still not very dependent on that work, then it becomes scheduling by coincidence of needs, which means, well, you work when work happens to be available on the platform. So when both the kind of employer side and the worker side happen to coincide in terms of, well, now would be a nice time to work, then you work. Sometimes you can't work even if you wanted to because there isn't any work available, and sometimes the employer can't get you to work even if they wanted to because you're not available. But the problems begin if you're strongly dependent on the income. Let's say it's your only source of income and there's only a limited amount of work available. Then essentially what happens is you're going to have to work when the work is available. So if it's something, it, it, the same thing applies to categorizing social media posts, uh, uh, food deliveries, rights. They're all very cyclical. The demand over time is not uniform, but it has strong peaks and throughouts. And this means even though in principle you're uh, allowed to choose exactly when you want to work, if you want to get those gigs, you have to be online when the peak in the demand happens. So that means it becomes what in the literature is known as uh, manager-controlled flexible scheduling. Although in this case it's not really, it's not, there isn't any manager sitting there and saying, no, you work. But in practice, the structural pressures drive you to work during those peak hours. So very different outcomes uh, depending based on 
on where in the uh, labor market you are, essentially. Some other challenges, individual responsibility. So this is the same as in any self-employment. Uh, if you have temporary changes in your productivity, such as illness, uh, you bear the, the cost of that. Um, same with childcare. Interestingly, with also with skills and career development, this is something we have a, a project right now ongoing with the CETAFOP, the uh, European Center for Development of Vocational Training, looking at how do these online uh, gig workers maintain and develop their skills. Because the employer isn't providing training, the, the, there isn't any coordinated effort to keep their skills up to date as labor market needs change. So how, does, how is this actually happening? How do these workers learn? This is something we're studying right now. Um, but yes, there's some of these things that would normally be socialized to the organizational level, such as temporary changes in one's productivity. Usually those would be evened out on the organizational level in, 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 in standard employment. I don't want to say usually, I want to say in standard employment. Um, the temporary changes in one's productivity, the impacts of that are, are the cost is borne by the entire organization. The risk is socialized across all the workers in the organization. Whereas in this mode of working, it's the individual that uh, directly bears that risk. Um, and then finally, the lack of support from state, from employers, from unions, because our Social policy systems are built around notions of standard employment. Uh, the, the kinds of support that platform workers would require are, are not really in place. Instead, what we're seeing is people organizing into peer groups that attempt to provide forms of mutual support to each other. Uh, sharing information, sharing tips, um, to some extent sharing bargaining power, political power. There's some efforts towards workers organizing and, and, and asserting themselves politically. Although there's big constraints on that because as I said in the beginning, these people come from very, very different backgrounds, very different interests towards the work. Some might just be looking to earn a little bit of extra income. For some it's a matter of their livelihood. So there, it is harder for them to find a common uh, platform. I mean platform in the political sense, not in the technical sense. Yeah. So then finally, uh, let me say something about the, the future of platform mediated work. So I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, I can't predict the future, but I can give some thoughts on it based on what the, the firms who use platform labor, the, the platform developers and the workers themselves have told us. So the first thing to note is that not everything is going to be platformized in any future. You know, not everything is going to be platform based. Here's a, a manager at a Fortune 500 company told us that it doesn't necessarily mean that our 10,000 plus employees today aren't going to be 10,000 plus employees in 10 years. It could mean that they're leveraging an additional 10% of folks who, are, uh, who, who do work differently online. So according to this view, uh, platform-based work is a complement rather than a substitute for standard employment. The other point to make is that I mentioned labor market inclusion, that for many people this is the way to get at least some kind of work. So if we are able to address labor market inclusion, for example, better opportunities for um, immigrants, then I think a lot of the demand for especially the lower end of platform-based work will go away. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not that people are necessarily uh, uh, choosing platform, in this instance, choosing platform-based work over standard employment, it's just a standard employment isn't available. Having said that, not nearly all of the workers want standard employment. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the freelancers that we've spoken with, they have 
chosen a freelance career. They see themselves as self-employed. Um, they have, uh, they have, they at, at the same time, whilst wanting better protection and whilst recognizing the, uh, the 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 problems and sometimes in some cases the precarity of their situation, they also genuinely uh, wish to remain self-employed. And interestingly, this doesn't just apply to the highest end of the market. Also, recently in the, the UK, delivery workers, delivery platform workers, the platform called Deliveroo, have been um, campaigning for rights. But they have not been campaigning for standard employment, for a recognition as standard employees. They wish to retain the flexibility of being able to turn the app off at any time and turn the app on at any time. So they want protection, but they want, at the same time, the flexibility um, that the platform-based work offers as well. So it's not necessarily just a matter of, um, let's just turn all of this into standard employment. The, another thing to note is that I think that different segments, so going back to this, this picture, different segments of platform-mediated work uh, will have very different future trajectories and future potentials. So as we think about uh, policy responses as well, I think it's very important not to just talk about platforms in general, but are we t what talk about local routine platform work or remote non-routine skilled platform work. These will have uh, different requirements. Although interestingly, there may be shifts and transformations between these categories. So, for example, we've heard a lot about how automation is changing the driving of uh, delivery trucks or, uh, uh, or taxis. I don't think that, I think it's unrealistic to expect that automation will completely replace drivers. But I think what may well happen is that driving becomes an indoor job, that you no longer go out and drive in the car that you do so from a control center. And if that happens, then interestingly, Uber moves from being local routine work to, more, to being remote uh, routine work. At the same time, some of the things that 20 years ago we thought as non-routine have now uh, become routine jobs. So, so these, these categories will change. I would say just one word on policy responses, which is that I think there's two different angles to approaching this. One is to look at what kind of duties and obligations can we put on the employers or the platforms in order to safeguard workers' interests. The other approach is to ask what kind of support can we provide to workers so that they are able to, uh, for themselves, negotiate uh, better uh, pay and, and, and working conditions. And these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I think to different segments of the platform-mediated economy, different approaches might be more suitable. In some cases, it's easier to identify um, a platform as the de facto employer that should in fact have some kind of, of, of uh, duties or should comply with existing uh, employment law and regulations. In some cases, the platform is much more clearly a mediator in what is genuine self-employment and entrepreneurship. So just as in the 1970s and 1980s, the transformation of the economy was accompanied by big, big uh, policy actions and policy responses. So there was a development of public services. Um, the social security system was strengthened. Um, the national basic education system was built and occupational health and welfare administration was created. Just as at that time, the transformation was accompanied by bold policy moves that allowed Finland to become one of the leading societies today and in terms of opportunities and egalitarianism. In the same way, I think that this digital transformation 
must be accompanied also by po bold policy moves that are uh, with, with the same ideals uh, in mind. So that's the tremendous task that uh, I leave for you as the policymakers in this room. And I hope that I will be able to inform you at least a little bit uh, based on some of the research that we've done. So thank you very much for your attention. I believe we have uh, a little bit of time for a discussion. Indeed. Thank you very much, Willy. And, and the floor is open now for your questions. First up there. And please speak to the mic because this is streamed. Hi, uh, Johannes Antila from the think tank Demos Helsinki. Uh -huh. uh, you went over some policy choices, but I was interested uh, what sort of action points uh, does this, like, the sort of spread of the platform economy create for labor unions? Do we need to create new sorts of labor unions like the IWGB in uh, Great Britain, or do we, or can like existing labor unions somehow tackle these challenges? Uh, the, this is a complicated topic. Uh, I don't have any magic bullet answers, but what I can say so is we've studied and are continuing to study w these online freelancers attitudes uh, towards unions as well as their own attempts at organizing and some of the things we're seeing is that in general the uh, online freelancers don't really see unions as representing their cause at the moment they have this more often they have a more entrepreneurial identity which kind of precludes uh, unions but at the same time they are very keen on protection and, and collective means of uh, uh, obtaining protection and advancing their cause. So there's a bit of a sort of contradiction even in some ways. And they are forming networks and peer groups of their own. Although th these are of limited effect as I can discuss in detail. So one of the ideas that we're playing with is that, you know, if I was advising unions, I would probably tell unions to engage with these uh, grassroots online peer groups of the workers and see how they could be empowered and supported rather than attempting to sort of build structure f structures from scratch. My name is Henrik Kaaperi and I work with the Trade Union Pro and um, I, I disagree with you a bit because I think that uh, there's a lot of examples of organizing in, in Platforms, for example, the New York Uber drivers have a union mm. right now. Uh, you said about lack of protection by the state. There was a decision on Uber drivers in, uh, in the Great Britain. And now, just a week ago, we got the first collective agreement for platform workers in the cleaning sector in Denmark. So we're actually working a lot with the, with the platform workers and the cloud workers. Perhaps it is the best if the people who are working with the platforms would organize themselves. But the resources that trade unions right now have in, in the Western world, of course, offer much yes. more. So, so hopefully there will be more collaboration between these uh, parties. But we'll see what happens. At least I think all of the trade unions in, 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 uh, in OECD countries are trying to organize yes. and trying to find new ways. I think we are in a, in a same situation that we were in, uh, that we were in 10, 15 years with temporary work, that there was no legislation. And uh, <clears throat> the business idea of these companies who offered labor, uh, of course, they had the, the business idea was to somehow make the work cheaper. And I think most of these platform forms have the same idea that uh, they don't buy, uh, bind the law at the same, same kind of law that the normal uh, employers, so they get competitive mm. edge out of that. And I think at least uh, the worst cases should be uh, not allowed in the future.
I, I think it's, it's a, I completely agree with your points. I think the distinction is between the, uh, the routine side. So all of the examples of organizing that you mentioned that are going on, they have happened in the sort of in this box here. Um, whereas I suppose when I was talking about entrepreneurial identities, for example, it's more in this box here. And this relates to my point that I think we need to t look at these different boxes with a very different eye and with uh, different strategies. And I do think that a lot of the stuff in here uh, is, um, is employment in disguise and you ought to just be enforcing existing uh, regulations on the books. Having said that, I think it's quite interesting if you look at Uber and Deliveroo drivers, for example, they have very active Facebook groups and they don't necessarily, we have a, an amazing um, student right now looking at these groups and they don't necessarily, in those groups they start to build collective identities, uh, but they don't necessarily then see unions always as legitimate um, representatives of their interests. So I think there's a, uh, the collaborative approach that you outlined is the correct one, but there's work to be done in terms of um, gaining the, the trust of a lot of these groups, I think. The questions, myös suomeksi voi varmasti esittää kysymyksiä. Joo, kernaasti. Yes, I'm Carl Gustav Linden from the University of Helsinki. Uh, when you talk about policy responses, what yes. sort of, what policy responses have you seen so far? <coughs> well, I, there aren't really any great examples. Of course, in, so again, if we talk about this box, there's been more going on. Uh, and it's mostly being, and I'm not an expert on, on this box, the regulations related to this box, but obviously, for example, Uber has been very active in lobbying uh, states in the US to uh, change their uh, laws and regularize ride hailing in a way that um, recognizes, this, recognizes it as somehow independent work rather than employment. Uh, I think this box, there's uh, not much happening because it's this kind of goes under the radar. It's not deliver drivers in the UK, they're on the streets, they're in your face all the time, you can't miss it. So that's, this gets a lot of the attention and the action, but I think there's a lot going on elsewhere as well um, that we're not, not responding to in the same way. Um, in the EU, the trouble has been, the difficulty has been that the commission has been very keen to have a harmonized EU-wide approach, which I think is makes total sense. Um, but because social policy is not within the union's competence, they've tried to see this as a matter of information society policy, digital policy, which in which case the commission has competence. Uh, but so they've tried to classify Uber and so on as information society services. And at the same time, the national regulators and, and local regulators have been saying, no, we need to see these as uh, employment agencies, as, as um, this is a matter of employment regulation and social protection. And so the kind of choice has been between either a harmonized approach that doesn't really recognize the social dimension or a national fragmented approach that does, but then is not, in my opinion, very good for European competitiveness or uh, indeed safeguarding the same rights for all Europeans. So I don't think I have any great examples right now of how things should be done. But just, I mean, what I was kind of referring to when I said support of the two angles, okay, we can put either obligations and duties on employers or we can support workers so that they have a better bargaining position. I was talking about the, the enthusiasm around universal basic income. So what if you had UBI, then people would not have to take the worst gigs because they would be in a better bargaining position. But I uh, am not an expert on the economics of UBI, whether it is feasible or not. So I, I don't take a, a stand on that matter myself. But it's an example of a policy that approaches from the let's support the workers rather than let's build obligations on the platforms angle. And we have time for one more question. Any questions left?
Thank you. My name is Lari Kangas. Um, and greetings from Cape Town. I, I just uh, arrived from there and live there. Um, I'm wondering about the, the regulation uh, aspect of this, and, and especially when, when fintech um, and um, mobile money comes more regular here in Finland. It's difficult to understand. Uh, in Finland, we don't, have, we don't use mobile money much yet, um, nor do we have Uber. Um, so, so bear with me. But I, in Cape Town, um, if you take your regular Uber driver or Taxify or um, um, other uh, platform taxi services or other platform services, um, the, the, the usual employee is a foreigner, um, an immigrant, most likely an illegal immigrant. And it becomes very interesting when you realize that they, the way they get paid is with mobile money. Um, the mobile money use in, by comparison to Finland or Scandinavia is about 12 times more in Africa than and Eastern Africa and Southern Africa than, than in Finland. So mobile money is the way you convert, converse with, uh, convert with, with uh, salaries and, and, and payments. So what has happened is that these immigrants that are the taxi drivers, they get paid in mobile money. But oftentimes that mobile money is not even regulated in the country where they work. So in Cape Town, for example, Zimbabwean drivers come and work in Cape Town and get paid in Zimbabwe in EcoCash. So the money actually goes into their accounts in Zimbabwe. So it becomes extremely cumbersome when you think about it from the regulatory point of view. How do you regulate that? How, the, the person doesn't exist in the country. It's an illegal immigrant. The, the company that they work for, the platform, doesn't um, open their books, and and the, the 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 payment that they get for their labor is actually being paid in another country or digitally in all the countries. Now, vision this in Finland. Fair question at the end of this because I think we're running out of time. Sorry. Digi to how, how to regulate when digital payments are coming as and mobile money is coming to be part of the payments on, in, in uh, platform economy? Yeah, I think it's a valid uh, challenge. Fortunately, in Finland, we have good, in, in the Nordics in general, we have good population registries. We have good quality regulation and registries. We need to keep that, which in the UK, it's a massive problem right now. Home office is accidentally deporting people because they, they don't have their files up to date, which is a, a terrible tragedy. And I think that um, in, in the Nordics, if we just keep the quality of government and administration as it is now, a lot of these problems that, for example, mob, that you mentioned mobile money in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa are not a big issue here. In general, I think that in this country, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, it, you know, it, it, it isn't... The Nordics are at the forefront of thinking about policy responses. You know, Danish are also in touch with me, Swedish unions and so on. And ironically, these are the countries where this is likely to kind of happen least, at least in terms of employment. Um, but I think that we can, as a final word, I guess, I, I think that uh, we can actually, as a, as a small open society with a very highly skilled and well-educated populace, I think that we can be uh, among the, the winners when it comes to having an, uh, an, an open environment for trading in skills, for Finnish companies to buy specialized skills from abroad, as well as for Finnish uh, uh, skilled workers to offer their specialized skills um, around the world. So I think that's a nice positive note to finish on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think one more applaud is it, uh, Steve.